BNN Motors in Boston. Uh, my name is Steve Alvos. I am actually the area manager for BNN Motors USA. Uh, so we really are very happy to have you guys here. We have Sean Thomas, who is our uh, brand ambassador for BMW. We also have Luis, who is our brand expert. They're going to actually go over the new 1300 GS with you. And uh, after that, we'll be all done. This is just questions, questions and answers, and get a chance to sit on the bike. So enjoy. Started. I don't know who whistled, but if it was for me, thank you. <laughs> it's so. obviously for you. I mean, look at you. <laughs> so, hey, everybody, I'm Sean Thomas, BMW brand ambassador. I think I've met most of, us. Most of you <laughs> by now. But uh, anyhow, I'm uh, the brand ambassador for BMW. And that basically means it's my job to help you understand the subtle and delicate nuances of BMW products. And I'm here with Louise Colin Powers. And I'm a BMW Motorrad brand expert, and my job basically is to make Sean sound and look good. <laughs> As you can see. <laughs> so, we're here to show you the new BMW R1300GS. And before we do that, we're going to tell you a couple stories um, about the 1300GS and about GSs in the past. I'm going to start by telling you a story about how we came upon these stories. So Louise and I run a podcast for BMW Germany, among other things, it's called Ride and Talk. And we get to interview current and past employees of BMW, among other people, and they tell us stories about the development of products. And we've had a chance to meet the very first person that developed the GS all the way up to the guy that developed this one. And they tell us, we find it in German, so you feed them a little beer, they tell you a few stories, it's good stuff. So we got to know them very well, and heard some very interesting stories that we're gonna share with you about these products. These all come more or less directly from the inebriated mouths of some very interesting German people. Does that sound good? <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna start with this machine here. Anybody remember what that is? Uh, Already right. GS. Anybody know what the GS stands for? Yep. Lendestrasse. Lendestrasse. Up until this moment, that's what you will believe. It actually has a different meaning, and I'll explain that in a minute. The story goes, in the 1970s, BMW corporate in Munich, their corporate headquarters, you've seen the big four cylinder building in corporate headquarters, they had a rule. And the rule was that if you rode or drove a BMW motorcycle, you were allowed to park it in their coveted VIP underground parking area. But if you rode a non BMW, you had to park it out on the street like a peasant and walk all the way in. So one day they were having a meeting about motorcycles and in that meeting was a guy named Hans Muth. And Hans at the time was one of their head designers at BMW. And they were talking about how they had get, needed to get people more interested in BMW motorcycles. And Hans was staring out the window at his Range Rover, which he had driven in and they'd made him park out on the street. And he said in the meeting, we should make a Range Rover type motorcycle. That's never been done. Big bike, long range, on road, off road. And he said it at the perfect moment with the perfect people who said, give it a go. And right then and there, they decided to try to build that platform. And that was his first design, it was the R80GS. And he personally named it the R80GS. The GS stood for Gentleman's Scrambler. That was his name for the bike. And he did not know that they had changed it to Glendestrasse, which means certain street, until the launch, the press launch. And he said he turned to the group because that's not what his name is. That's a Gentleman's Scrambler. And they said, Hey man, the bike's very cool, but the name is stupid. The name has to go. So it is Glenda Strasse to this day. Except that we we only interviewed him a couple of months ago. He's 89 and long retired from doing this, but that man is holding on to it being gentleman scrambler yeah. like forever. It will always be that to him. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll get to hear him talk about that a little bit. <laughs> so the big problem they faced with this bike at the time people didn't realistically think that it could be ridden off-road. It was too big a motorcycle for off-road riding. So to combat that, they decided to build this platform here, which may be familiar to some of you. That is the Dakar bike. They raced this in the Dakar in the 80s. If you've ever followed the Dakar, it is an insane competition. It's about two weeks long, riders go from 12 to 16 hours a day of very, very intense riding. Most people on motorcycles do not make it to the end. It has about an 85% attrition rate. But BMW won this race and they won it very, very handily with this bike. They had an 11 gallon gas tank on it and the, the first place guy came in two hours ahead of anybody else. It was very, very impressive. Which got people really interested in this motorcycle. So they gave us the next evolution of the bike, which was this. And 
this bike came around in about 1994, 1995, and you could say that there were more iterations in between the R80 and this. There's the R100 GS and there's the Paris Dakar, but this was the next big evolution, and part of this came because there was now a new head designer for BMW. Hans had retired, he was no longer doing this, and a man, a man named Edgar Heinrich took over. And he was actually the, desi the head designer up until, what is today, the seventh? Until about eight days ago. He has only just retired. So if you have ridden a BMW motorcycle that was made anywhere from the early 90s until now, you're riding something that he had a big hand in designing and engineering. So this was his first go at the GS, and this is where we start to see it get a little bit bigger and a little bit burlier and a little bit more the shape and style that we know and love. And this bike, in being designed, started at the front, okay? So BMW did not make or design headlights. Man motorcycle manufacturers across the board did not make or design their own headlights. They went to a company that made lights and they said, this is what we need. We need this much light. It needs to do this sort of thing. And in this case, they went to Bosch and Bosch said, all right, here's your headlight. And Edgar Heinrich said, that is real ugly. And they said, too bad, this is what you did. So he actually designed this motorcycle from that headlight front to back. That's where he started, was with the headlight on this, which at the time, he just thought it was ugly. But this has become a bike that we've really started to recognize. Now, Edgar Heinrich was also in charge of the next iteration of the GS, the R1150. And he all, once again went to Bosch to get his headlight design. And he decided to do something different. He made the asymmetric headlights, one big and one small. And he told us that when he launched this, everybody that had a voice said, that is the dumbest thing you've ever done on a bike. Nobody's gonna want a bike with two different size headlights. Of course, we know today, that it's no big deal. But at the time, it was a seriously big deal. The other big deal about this bike is that it is a very big motorcycle. And people were once again asking, can you really ride this bike off-road? Is it very realistic to do that? Well, luckily for BMW, a company that was making a film got a couple of these bikes and put two guys on it and rode around the world on it. It's a seven-episode series where we watch two guys ride just about everywhere. Anybody remember what that show was called? Yeah. All the way around. All the way around. Yeah, you and McGregor and Charlie Borman showed us that we too could ride a bike around the world. If you're rich and you've got a whole team of people supporting you, even if you're a terrible rider, <laughs> you too could do it. But this was a really inspiring um, bit of you know TV for people to watch. I know it was for me. I only learned to ride a motorcycle 12 years ago and I did it so that I could ride my motorcycle to Alaska. So the whole reason I learned to ride a motorcycle was so that I could go to Alaska. I'm like, okay, why not? And honestly, if, if, if two actors could do it and they cried like every other episode, I figured I would probably be okay. I cried one time for about five seconds in my helmet. That's all it was. But this was really inspiring for a lot of us. We went, oh, like, uh, I could probably handle this bike in all sorts of crazy conditions just like they did. I was selling motorcycles right around the time this show came out and people started really coming in and paying attention and saying, I'm interested in the GS. And Edgar Heinrich and his team said, it's time to make the new evolution of the GS, which brought us to this bike. This is what we call the Hexhead GS. From 2005 to 2012, we saw the R1200 GS. And this story, this picture is a funny story. So that's, uh, if you don't recognize it, that's the corkscrew at Laguna Seca. I happened to live 20 miles from Laguna Seca, and my buddy convinced me that we should take our bikes to a track day at Laguna Seca, and we should ride in the advanced group, even though I'd never been to a track day in my life, which was a terrible idea, and I got my rear end handed to me something fierce, but somebody captured this photo of me in the corkscrew, and it was pretty good. Social media had just become a thing, and I posted it online, and BMW found it. They had no idea who I was at the time, but they came to me, and they said, hey, we saw this photo of you, and it's really good, and we'd like to use it in an ad campaign. And I said, that's awesome, what do I get? They said, you get to say you've been in an ad campaign. And I said, done, I'm in. Now, this motorcycle brought us to the next evolution of the GS, which was the new liquid cool GS. That's 2012 until now. Now, at that time in my career, I was a freelance journalist among other things, and I had written a story about how I wondered how this bike would manage off-road because it was the first time we'd seen an adventure motorcycle with radiators. And 
at this size. And I thought, I wonder how it's going to do. If you drop the bike, is it going to break a radiator? Is it going to be busted out of whack in that simple situation? And BMW contacted me and said, we'd like you to have a, we like your article. We'd like to give you a chance to ride this motorcycle for yourself. So they flew me out and put me on that bike for three days. And I got a chance to ride it and really get to know the bike. And just my, my personal love for GS has really started to grow at that moment. Which brought us to the current iteration of the GS, the one that many of you probably have, the R1250 GS. And this is my personal bike. This is what I ride all the time. And the evolution from the 1200 GS to the 1250 was not just simply 50 cc's more. BMW came up with something that was really fantastic and changed how this engine worked and it was called shift cam technology. Okay, so when you're riding around at sort of normal, moderate, regular RPMs, your camshaft opening has a very small opening and it's sipping on gas, it's mixing with air and it's giving you really great fuel gas mileage for your speeds in what you're doing. But when you want extra power, even if you are already high up in those RPMs and you're going fast, if you roll hard on that throttle in six tenths of a second, that camshaft shifts to a larger opening and gas comes pouring in and mixing with air, swirling around and you get instant power. And so this gave us the ability to have not only more horsepower, and greater use of that horsepower, but we could keep our gas mileage as long as we were keeping our RPMs, you know, within a reasonable range. I will tell you, Sean did pass on the tradition of taking a newbie to the track on a GS and saying, oh, we don't need to be in the beginner group. No, 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 we'll go in the advanced group. And I'm like, are you crazy? You talk about that every day, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, so. <laughs> So he did that to me. So the one downside to the chip cam technology is that I get like a hundred miles on my tank at the track. And I feel like those hundred miles put a bigger smile on my face than any other bike that you know I would ride. And so that evolution to that chip cam technology, like it made a huge difference for me. And I'm just like, this bike is amazing. I love it. Because of that, and for a lot of reasons, people tend to ask us a few basic questions about the 1300. And, and what they originate from is, is it worth upgrading from a 1250, for example? Is it really that much different? Or did they take a 1250 and bore it out, for example? And um, I think that we all ask that question, including Louise and I, when we ride a new bike for the first time, is this gonna be any better than what we have? We both currently own 1250s. But we've both ridden the 1300, and this bike's had a complicated life. <laughs> there's, there's almost not a single bolt that is carried over from the 1250 to the 1300. It took five years and it has been completely redesigned from the ground up. Let me like take a minute to introduce it to you. That sound good? Yeah. My friends, let's take a look at the new BMW R1300 GS. I'm sure you have questions about this bike and we'd like to answer them. We also want to give you a chance to look at it firsthand. But first, we want to tell you a little bit about the bike and some of the new features. Now, the biggest questions we ask is starts with weight. This bike is 523 pounds. That is its wet weight. That means full of gas and ready to ride. And that's a significant drop in weight from the 1250. How much? Yeah, it's 26 pounds less than the 1250. So now we've gotten our bigger bike and we even have less weight. In fact, I have a very fat cat and it's two of my cats less than my 1250. <laughs> it's an extraordinarily fat cat. Um, this bike also comes standard with a lot of features that used to be optional. Heated grips, cruise control, tire pressure monitor. Those are just examples of features that it comes with, even with the most basic version of the bike. Now, in terms of power, this bike puts out 145 horsepower, which is a nine horsepower bump from the 1250. And it puts out 110 foot pounds of torque, which is five foot pounds more than the 1250. Now, a big place that they dropped weight is in the drivetrain itself. In the past, on a drivetrain, the transmission has always been bolted to the back of the block. 
Now in the 1300, they have taken the transmission off the back, dropped it down and slid it inside the block underneath the crank. So what this gives us is, first of all, a much better center of gravity because the transmission is very heavy. So when you drop it down and slide it forward, it makes the bike feel a lot more flickable. And because you don't have the big bell housing for the transmission anymore, the overall weight is dropped. This bike is 15 pounds, 14 pounds lighter than its predecessor, just in the drivetrain alone. Now, this bike has a lot of technology of which you would expect and that you probably know a little bit about. But just so we're clear on exactly what it is, the first is analog brakes. Now, this bike, most motorcycles these days have ABS brakes. And when we think of ABS, we think of that pickup ring in the center of the screen that you see there. And as the wheel spins, the pickup ring reads the motion of the bike. And if the wheel stops spinning when it's supposed to be moving, the bike will release the brake and reapply. It's how ABS works, simply put. We've all felt it, especially in our cars. You hit a brake too hard, and you feel the brake vibrate against your foot, that's the brake releasing and reapplying. Now the 1300 GS comes standard with ABS Pro. ABS Pro looks at your wheel spin, but it also looks at the lean angle of the motorcycle. The more aggressively the bike is leaned into a turn, the more the ABS interacts differently with the road surface. And you can actually feel this on this bike. If you're riding this motorcycle in a straight line, and you reach out and you put your fingers on the brakes, not enough to make it really slow down, but just enough to have some pressure on the lever. And while you're doing that, you lean the bike into a turn, you'll feel the lever start to push back against your fingers. That's ABS Pro functioning. What it does is the more you lean the bike, the more resistance it puts on the lever. That way, when you're in a turn and you squeeze the brake as hard as you normally do, that amount of squeeze does not apply as much brake. That lessens the opportunity for the tire to break free from the road surface. Now, ABS Pro is not a new technology. We've seen it on motorcycle BMW since 2015. It's the first time we've seen it as a standard feature on the 1300GS. Now, another technology is throttle response. What exactly is happening to the throttle bodies when you roll on the throttle? Electronic throttle is a big part of this. And to understand throttle response, you have to go back to 1984. 1984 was a banner year for motorcycles. It was the birth of the modern sport bike. The very first sport bike that we would consider of its kind today came out in 1984. I'd like to see if you can guess what it was. It was the very first sport bike. I'm gonna give you a hint, it was not a BMW. Yeah, thanks, GSXR S750 is a good, very good guess. Any other guesses? Honda, yeah, okay. Anybody else? For my money, the BMW or the uh, Kawasaki Ninja, not 900. No, I happened to own one of these bikes back in the day. This is also the Top Gun bike. Remember from the movie? And because I look a lot like Tom Cruise and I own one, I feel like this is the one. Now you can argue that there are other bikes that came out with it first, but the, this was an iconic motorcycle. It showed us that you could have a juggernaut of power and terrible braking and handling all in one motorcycle. <laughs> now, a lot of manufacturers started making their own versions of this. So we had the Suzuki Katana, which eventually became the Suzuki GSXR. We had the Honda Hurricane, which eventually became the Honda CBR. Now, of course, bikes like this were racing. They were competitive motorcycles. And bikes that race, if they win, those are the ones that sell. The dealers at the day, we all knew. You win on Sunday, you sell on Monday. Now BMW wanted to play in this world too, so they came out with their own sport bike, which was this. That is a BMW K1. Very futuristic looking motorcycle for its time, but no way is this bike gonna keep up with the Hondas and the Suzukis and the Kawasakis of the day. It was way too underpowered and it was way too heavy. But they knew at BMW they gotta win races if they wanna sell sport bikes. So they came up with a brilliant plan. It was called the Boxer Cup Series. And what they did is they took a whole bunch of BMW motorcycles and they put racers on them and they sent them off on the races. And they were the only ones on the track and no matter who won, BMW won. And that was their way to win races for a long time. They did this for decades. And back in 2009, they came to the dealers and said, we actually have a sport bike that's pretty awesome. And we think that this is gonna be the one that beats everybody else. And we, of course, the dealers said, there's no way. You guys always find a way to screw it up. And they gave us this bike. That is the S1000RR. And, and for reference, that's a picture of me with hair. <laughs> now, is it that bad? Uh, <laughs> so, what was interesting about this bike is it really was as powerful as the sport bikes the other bikes of its type. It was priced about the right same, and it was quite agile. So it really had all the makings of a really good sport bike. And as we know, it turned out to be an amazing one. But there was one thing they wanted this bike to have. 
They wanted it to have an electronic throttle. The benefit to electronic throttle is they can really acutely adjust the throttle bodies for a whole host of reasons. Whether it's how you own the throttle or how some of the other electronics on the bike interact with it is a really good idea. But at the time, nobody in the sport bike world used an electronic throttle. And they knew that if they put that on the bike, it would scare a bunch of people off because people don't like new tech on sport bikes. So what they did on this bike is they put a throttle cable on it. And the throttle cable went around and disappeared into the bike. And where it disappeared, they quietly converted it into an electronic throttle. So you saw a throttle cable, but they got their way and had their little nuancy electronic throttle. They did that for one year. And for 2010, for the next version of it, they said, hey, glad everybody likes the RR. We have a new version. And among other things, it has an electronic throttle. But it did anyway, as I'm sure you knew. So you're going to love it. Now everybody uses electronic throttle on bikes. And the reason that's very important is going to become clear on some of the other slides. Like, for example, traction control. How much is the rear wheel allowed to spin in relation to the front? How much you want the rear wheels to spin depends on a whole bunch of factors. What your lean angle is, what riding mode you're in, whether you're on-road or off-road, these are all factors. And what the bike does is it watches the front wheel and compares it to the rear. And if the rear wheel is spinning faster than the front, it has the ability to equalize them by rolling off the throttle digitally. So even if you have the throttle pinned, the bike will roll off to make the wheels equalize. Now this bike has traction control that works based on lean angle. So in addition to watching wheel spin, it looks at how far the bike is leaning to a turn. The more aggressively the bike leans, the more aggressive the traction control is. And you, if you ever watch sport bikes on the racetrack, you'll see the racers use this technology. You'll see them get on the bike into a turn, and they'll hang their weight off the inside, and they'll go through the turn, and as the road straightens out, you'll see them thrust the bike upright, but they are still hanging off the bike. And the reason they do that is because they know that as they lean the bike into a turn, the traction control gets very aggressive and it won't allow the bike to accelerate very quickly. And as soon as they get into a straight, they throw the bike upright, which makes the traction control relax and makes the bike take off like a shot. So then they push the bike up and then as the bike really takes off, they shimmy their weight back onto the bike. It's a little bit more cumbersome on a GS, but you can't be done. Now, Another technology on motorcycles is suspension, right? I found as we tour around the country, people don't always have a great grasp of how suspension works. I'm gonna break it down very quickly. When we talk about suspension, we talk about preload and we talk about damping. Preload is how much weight's on the bike. So this bike right now with no weight on it, the shock in the back looks like this. If I were to sit on this motorcycle and I were to put a passenger on it and put all my luggage on it, that same rear shock gets compressed and it looks more like this. And that is a lot of compression. And if I go for a ride like this, the bike is gonna ride like this. The front end's gonna be way up high and it'll be really uncomfortable up front and shaky. So normally what I would do is take that little hand crank and I would crank it until the suspension on the back didn't compress as much. But generally the rule is, is that you want the suspension to sag about 20% of its travel. So if I have five inches of suspension travel, when I sit on it, I want it to sag one inch. That would be 20%. So I would turn that crank until that occurred. And then when I'm running down the road, I have to consider damping. Now damping is the stiffness of the shock. So when I'm riding in the performance riding, like around corners, I like a very good stiff suspension. It makes the bike very responsive and agile. But if I'm going down the road and the road is straight and bumpy, then I want the suspension to be soft so that it absorbs a lot more bumps. Now, if you imagine inside the suspension, there is an hourglass. This is a major oversimplification but bear with me and inside that hourglass instead of there being sand there is oil and every time the suspension compresses say you hit a speed bump the oil is forced from the top chamber to the bottom chamber of the hourglass and every time the suspension rebounds or comes off the speed bump that same oil is forced from the bottom to the top of the chamber when you adjust the damping you're adjusting the opening between the two chambers the opening is very small and it takes a lot of force to shove the oil from one chamber to another. That makes the bike feel very responsive and very fun for twisties. And if the opening is really big, then the oil splashes back and forth between two very easily. That makes the suspension very soft and compliant. So traditionally what you would do is you get on your bike, you'd adjust the preload based on how much weight you have on it, and then you go for a ride. And then when the road starts getting twisty, you pull over to the side of the road, you get off your bike, get down on your hands and knees, 
find the damping adjustment, and sometimes it's a little flat bladed screw, you get in there and adjust it, mm -hmm. make it tighter again so that the bike is more responsive in the twisties. Then when you were finished with the twisties and you got into the straights again, you pull over, get out your tools, get on your hands and knees. And How many of you do that on a regular basis? There's always, there's always one. <laughs> now, I don't do that. It's, that's a lot of, I never really understood what I was doing when I made those adjustments, so I never did it. I was always afraid if I did it wrong, the bike would explode. But there was a guy that I found, and for 20 bucks, the guy would adjust my suspension for me. He was a suspension guru. And the guy had a British accent, so he knew he knew what he was talking about. <laughs> so one day I paid the guy 20 bucks, and he's making all these adjustments to my bike and adjusting the preload, the damping, and having me sit on him again and adjusting the, and he mentions to me, he goes, man, your suspension was really out of whack. It's very good that you came to me because it was dangerously out of tune. And, it's, and it's a wise man comes to me to get that fixed right. And I said, well, you probably don't remember this, but I came to you three weeks ago and I paid you 20 bucks then and I haven't touched it since. So I kind of feel like if it's knocked out of whack, it might be on you. Now, these days, Suspension's all electronically adjustable on most motorcycles. So when you're riding on the road, the, for example, this bike has auto leveling suspension. So when I sit on the bike, it automatically adjusts to my weight. So I can sit on it, I might feel a lot of sag and then the bike will bring itself back up so the sag is set at that 20% ideal situation. But Louise is much lighter than me, so when she sits on the bike, it doesn't sag enough. And the bike recognizes that and will sag a little bit more to accommodate her weight. And then this bike also adjusts its own damping. So as I'm running down the road, the damping is making adjustments based on the road surface, and it's very quick. If I hit a speed bump with the front tire on this bike, by the time the rear tire hits the same bump, the bike will have already compensated for it. It's very quick. It can adjust about 100 times per second. Now, dynamic damping also takes into consideration things like acceleration. Normally on a bike, when you're rolling the throttle really hard, the bike will respond by sinking in the back as the suspension compresses as you accelerate. On the 1300, the bike will automatically stiffen the rear suspension when you roll on the electronic throttle. That sends more power to the rear tire without it being absorbed by the suspension. It makes the bike feel a lot snappier. And the same with the front brake. If I hit the front brakes on this bike, it will stiffen the front suspension so that the bike has better, snappier braking. Other technologies on this motorcycle, Louise, you love a lot of these. Hill start control is something we've seen on GSs before and of course is available on the 1300. Yeah, so uh, with hill start control, you know, when, when they come to a stop on a hill, a lot of times you want to leave your right foot on the back brake so that you're, you know, holding your bike there. And for someone like me, when I'm on a hill, suddenly that ground has gotten quite a bit further away. And if the hill is off camera at all, now, like, I'm really reaching with my left foot to be able to get that foot down. With hill start control, I can ride up, I can squeeze my brake hard, and the bike will set its own rear brake and hold me on that hill. When I'm ready to ride away, I just roll on the throttle, let out the clutch, and once it overcomes that holding, the bike moves on. With Hill Start Control Pro, your bike will automatically sense that you're stopping on a hill, and it will automatically hold the bike there for you without you even having to squeeze the brake hard and let it know that that's what you want it to do. And with Hill Start Control Pro, it's fully adjustable, so you can have it say, Oh, I'm going to sense this hill for you and hold you automatically, or you can still do it yourself manually, or you can turn the whole thing off if you don't want to use it at all. And it works both on uphill and downhill, the one exception being that in, in Enduro Pro, it does not work on downhills because the bike is pretty certain that if you are on loose traction and you're going downhill, you probably want to control it yourself, which most of us who ride off-road know that that is definitely the case. This bike also has dynamic brake control. This is all about emergency braking. Now, statistically speaking, if you're riding your motorcycle and something runs in front of you, or suddenly there's an obstacle in front of you, the best bet almost every time is to get on the brakes. Trying to maneuver around obstacles sometimes work, but generally speaking, more often than not, getting on the brakes and getting on them hard when you recognize danger is the best way to go. Sometimes when people have a panic braking situation, a deer runs out in front of you, for example, we go, ha! And you reach out and stop on the brake. Sometimes people make a critical mistake, and that is that they don't let off the throttle first. So they're on the throttle riding down the road, and suddenly there's danger, and they go, ah, and they reach out and they grab the front brake, but they're also on the throttle as well. And for a whole host of reasons, it's a bad idea, because now you're under power and braking at the same time. 
What dynamic brake control simply means is that if you're in a situation where you're on the throttle and at the same time you stomp on the front brake, the bike will digitally roll off the throttle. So the bike will come to a safer stop. Those of you that are in the know on GSs and know the bikes and know the ride modes, for you I'd like you to know that that feature, the only exception is Enduro Pro. When you're in Enduro Pro, you can be on the brake, front brake and the throttle at the same time. There is a critical moment when this is important. one situation when you want to be able to be on the brake and the throttle at the same time. That's when you get stuck in the mud and you're sitting in the mud and your business partner rides up behind you. The only way to spray them with mud is to get on the throttle and the brake at the same time. This bike will allow for that as Louise knows. As I know because I made fun of him for dropping his bike in the mud once in front of students so now every chance he gets this is what he does. <laughs> Another technology is dynamic engine brake control. How much deceleration do you feel when you roll off the throttle? If you're riding aggressively, for example, and you want to ride it into a turn, a lot of times you'll pull in the clutch, dump two gears, dump the clutch, and the bike will accelerate, decelerate very aggressively. And then you can dump it into a turn and blow through. On this bike, you'll find that how much deceleration you feel varies depending on what ride mode you're in. In rain mode, for example, and I dump the throttle, you'll find that the deceleration is less aggressive. And if I get into one of the more aggressive riding modes, you'll find the de deceleration is more aggressive. Uh, integral brakes, what that means is that uh, traditionally boxer twins have had partial integral brakes. That means that if I apply the front, I will also get a little bit of rear, but rear is just rear. On the new 1300 and for the first time on the GS, this bike has fully integral brakes. That means that if I apply the front, I get a little bit of rear. If I apply the rear, I may get a little bit of front. How much I get will depend on how fast I'm going, what my lean angle is, and what ride mode I'm in. But the idea at the end of the day is to allow you to do all the things that you like to do with just the rear brake or just the front brake, only getting in your way in a situation when you need to get the bike stopped as quickly and safely as possible. And then, one of your favorites, Shift Assist Pro. Oh, I do love Shift Assist Pro. So um, Shift Assist Pro was developed for the track. So it was developed for the double uh, R for a track bike, the four cylinders. And it, this is where you can just be rolling on the throttle and you reach down with your foot and you click up through the gears. You don't have to clutch in order to change gears. Shift Assist Pro means that you can roll off your throttle and click down through the gears and downshift without using the clutch. Now it's an exceptional um, piece of technology, particularly on a track bike, and of course you want it on that, but it's actually really wonderful off-road also. Anybody who has ridden one of these bikes, these big uh, boxer engine bikes, using that knows, however, that shifting from first to second and second to third can sometimes be a little bit lurchy, right? Once you get higher up in the gears, it gets smoother, well, I am very happy to tell you that with the new 1300, they have smoothed that out remarkably. So now first to second and second to third are much, much smoother. They're now using a magnetic shift assist versus a spring shift assist. There's still a little bit of that hitch. There is so much compression in a big boxer twin engine like this that you still get a little bit of a twitch in from first to second, but you almost don't even notice it anymore. It is a massive improvement over the 1250. Mm. Now, another technology is rider assistance. We're seeing this emerging in a lot of motorcycles from different manufacturers. We've seen it in some BMWs. It's now available on the GS as well. Yeah, and so that starts with cruise control. So cruise control is now coming on all of these bikes, but there is an option which is adaptive cruise control. An adaptive cruise control means you can be in traffic, you can set your cruise control, and if you come up on someone going slower than you, because that'll probably happen, your bike will actually back off the speed and pace the vehicle in front of you. Once they move out of your way, the vehicle will speed back up to, your bike will speed back up to whatever speed it was that you had set. 
So in order to do that, there are now sensors on this bike that are sensing the traffic around you. And you'll see them. There's one on the front here and one on the back. They're very nice, smooth, matte black plastic. It looks like the absolute perfect place to put your favorite sticker. Don't put a sticker there though. Those are your sensors and you want to leave those available to sense the traffic around you. Because the other rider assistance that that brings you is that if someone is to move in front of you very quickly, your bike will give you a front co collision warning, okay? It'll flash a little message on your dashboard and you'll get haptics through your bars. So think of your phone vibrating, that will happen with your bars. If somebody moves in front of you, you haven't seen it and the bike says, you need to pick your head up. Look at what's going on. The same thing happens using a sensor on the back if someone comes up from behind you very quickly. If you're in the left hand lane and suddenly someone is back there and you didn't see them, the bike is like, hey, by the way, there's someone back there you might want to move over. So you can move over out of their way and let them go by. Those two sensors work together now also to give you a lane change warning. So we see a fair amount of this um, in cars. Lots of people have cars that have this and this works in a very similar way. You might be ready to change lanes and look over your shoulder, no one's there, and you put on your uh, signal, and you're gonna change lanes. Sometimes in that split second, we know somebody might zip right on into that space. This bike, you'll see when you sit on it, there's little triangles on the mirrors, and they'll flash yellow to let you know that someone's there. Now, all of this is fully customizable so that, you know, if, if you're not out riding in traffic and you don't want all this stuff being used all the time, you go through your menu and you, you can shut it completely off. You can tell it to only let you know if you're in like a dire situation. If you're riding in more traffic and you want more warning, you can set it so that it will do that. But what it does is it gives you, particularly like say in traffic out here, just that little bit of an extra help right before you have that opportunity to make the change, the bike helps you out with it. In fact, the front collision warning, if somebody gets in front of you and you do not slow down, you, maybe you just haven't paid attention quickly enough, the bike will actually slow down for you. It doesn't slow down hard and it doesn't bring you to a complete stop or anything like that but it does give you that little bit of advantage, that little bit of an edge over the traffic in your way. Now another technology you'll see when you come and sit on the bike is the new um, emergency call button. It's just over here by the right grip. And the, bit, the easiest way to describe this technology is it's the bike's own built-in cellular phone. It does not utilize any of your cell phone or technology that you have on your person. It does it all by itself. It's got its own SIM card, it's got its own microphone, and its own speaker all built into that button. And if you push that button, the bike will call the BMW Central Call Center and say, and you'll hear somebody start speaking to you through the button, and they'll say, is everything okay? And you can say, say if you come up on an accident, say, yeah, I can see there's been an accident. I don't think anybody's called uh, emergency services yet. And they'll say, we'll take care of it. And they'll ask you a few questions and they'll, they'll call them out for you. If you get in a major accident on your motorcycle, button will call you automatically because it will sense that there's been an accident and will ask if you're okay. And if you don't say, respond to it, it will send the cavalry out to you. And if you're like me, and you were riding one of these that has this in Spain, where you're adventure riding in Spain, you could drop a bike a lot, at least I do. And that button, if you don't tell it not to within 10 seconds of dropping your bike, it will call automatically. And I kept forgetting. So 10 seconds would go by and I'm laying on my side and suddenly this voice starts speaking to me in Spanish because I'm in Spain and it says, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish. And they said, oh, is this Sean again? <laughs> said, yes, it is. Is he okay? Yeah, I'm okay. All right, they hang up on you. Now, that button on this motorcycle is a standard feature on the GS. There is no additional cost for it and there is no subscription fee. It works if you want it. Or you can never use it if you don't want to. It's just another way to help keep you safe when you're out on the road. So they can track the bike at all times. Uh, sir, this bike, the button is, does it track the bike? This does not track unless you hit the button. And it only works if you have cell range. But they, there's nobody that's able to look at a computer and say, this is where this person is right now, unless you push the button. All right. It doesn't happen in the The headlight on this motorcycle has been a little controversial. 
And I gotta tell you a story. So I was in uh, Berlin when we launched this bike. And we had this big world, some of you may have watched the big worldwide premiere with a big video. And, and everybody that was there in Berlin, we had already done all of our work for that launch. And so we were all hanging out, having a beer and watching the launch with everybody else in the world. And we were watching it on YouTube. And in this room, it was full of all of the designers and engineers and managers that worked on this project for five years. And we had this big giant TV screen and we're watching the launch on YouTube. And on YouTube, in addition to watching the video, we're also seeing people's comments go by, but we can't read them because there was 20,000 people watching the launch and the comments were happening so quickly that they were just blurring by, it was just this blur of text. So none of us ever really were able to pick up what anybody was saying. But in the launch video, they showed the headlight for the first time and the comments were still going and I couldn't read them. But even when comments are blurring by fast, you can always tell a vomit emoji when it comes up. It's just like really distinctive, like green and yellow. And there's just this sea of them all of a sudden. And everybody hated the headlight. And that the designer, head of design, Edgar Heinrich, turned to me. He goes, remember what people said about the 1150 and the asymmetrical headlights? Everybody hated it. And they thought it was a crazy idea. Now they love it and everybody doesn't like this. But don't worry, they'll get used to it. And the truth is, is that we've shown this bike to a few people. And we find it in person. People tend to warm up pretty, pretty quickly to it. And it is really nice. The new headlight, the central light in the middle there, because it's LED, it is both the high and the low beam in one light. If you have the Headlight Pro, it's adaptive. So if you lean into a turn, the light will shine through the turn to help give you visibility. And the accent lights on the other side help to, uh, to give you lighting, especially in turns, and they get brighter when the high beam comes on. That being said, there's always at least one person in the group that goes, not doing that headlight, it's not for me. And that's okay, I understand. For you, I want to introduce you to this guy. Luis, can you pronounce his name? Because I always get it wrong. This is Guy de Maupassant. He's a Frenchman. Does anyone know who he is? <laughs> so oh, he was okay, a, uh, thank you. Yeah. He was a famous writer and poet in France. He also happened to live in Paris during the building of the Eiffel Tower. And he hated the Eiffel Tower. And he was a vocal opponent of its building and he tried to get it stopped. He obviously failed. If you've ever been to the Eiffel Tower, you know there's a restaurant in it. And once the Eiffel Tower was built, Almost every single day until the day he died, you could find this guy, Guy, having lunch in the restaurant in the Eiffel Tower. And somebody famously asked him once, if you hate the Eiffel Tower, why are you eating lunch here? He says, because this is the only place in the city that I can eat lunch and not have to stare at the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> and I love that story. And I learned that story in high school and I reminded of that when somebody told me they didn't like the headlight. Because I've ridden this bike, you can't see the headlight from the seat. <laughs> now, the adaptive vehicle height control is very interesting. And Louise, this is something that's near and dear to you. Yeah, and that's that's the reason why we specifically have this model because this model has the adaptive vehicle height control. So in the past on GSs, we've seen three different suspension options. There's a standard suspension. That's your standard height bike with your standard suspension travel. Then on some models, you get a sport suspension, right? So the bike sits a little bit higher and there's a little bit more suspension travel while you're riding. So if you ride a lot of pretty stout off-road, it's a really good way to go. Or if you're six foot four, it's a great way to go. Now, if you're on the other end of the spectrum where you're a little bit shorter, they also make a low suspension bike. And that bike is just a little bit shorter. You lose a little bit of ground clearance, for, but for anybody who's vertically challenged, it's a little more opportunity to get stable feet on the ground when you're stuck. With the new 1300 GS, there are still three suspensions available. There's a standard suspension, just like the standard suspension that we've seen on past GSs. There's also a sport suspension that is available with some of the variants, and you get about three quarters of an inch, a little more than three quarters of an inch extra suspension travel and extra ground clearance because the bike sits up a little higher but there is no more low bike. There is not a low bike being made at all. Instead, what is available is adaptive vehicle height. Okay, so what we have is a bike that when you are riding it, it is at a standard suspension height. But when you stop, the bike lowers itself. And the bike lowers itself an inch and a quarter almost. It's actually significant enough that it makes the bike shorter than what the low GS is of uh, were of the past. Okay, so anytime this bike is stopped, the bike is off, stopped, anything, it is in the low position. 
When you start riding, you get up to about 20 miles an hour and it takes three seconds and the bike raises itself up to that stock suspension height. Then you ride around, when you come back to stop, you hit about 12 miles an hour as you're slowing down and the bike lowers itself to its lowest position. And then it always stays in that low position when it stops. Now, while you have the ability to do all that with the adaptive ride height, you can actually tell the bike to always stay in its highest position if for some reason you want that. You have the ability to tell it to always stay in its lowest position if you want that, or you can have it do its little adaptive ride height dance. So this actually gives an opportunity to people who are shorter and who would like to have more foot on the ground and more security with their feet on the ground the, uh, the ability to not have to compromise whether they're going to lose ground clearance and have a lower bike while they're out riding. You don't have to make that decision anymore. So there's a standard height, the sport suspension height, and adaptive vehicle height control. Now, I mentioned that this bike is always in the low position when it stops. And for those of us who ride, my bike is a low bike. and. When I go to put my bike on the center stand, it's a pain. The geometry of trying to put that much weight onto the center stand when it's in that low position actually makes it much more difficult than when I put Sean's sport suspension bike on the center stand. So I have a little trick that I do on my bike. I go and I get on my bike and I pick it up off the kickstand. I turn it on, I start it up, and I put my suspension as high as it'll go and I feel the bike lift up, lift up until I barely have a toe on the ground. And then I get off the bike and just raising it up that little bit actually makes it considerably easier to put on the center stand. You don't have to do that anymore with this bike because even though it's in the low position, it has a nifty little trick. I'm gonna show it to you. And one of the first things I'm going to show you, you guys will be able to see pretty easily here is that the lever for the center stand now flips out of the way, okay? So if you are ever one of those people who rides standing up a lot and you find that your foot hits that, it won't, because when you're not using that stand, you just flip that out of the way. Anybody who has ever, and I totally understand if you're not gonna admit to this, although I did have someone a couple days ago admit to it, put your foot down and caught the edge of your pants on that lever and started to pull the bike over, that's not gonna happen anymore. And for people like me, when I move my bike around, when I'm off the bike, I have to stand so close to it because it weighs so much that I bruise my shins on that stupid lever on my 1250. And I'm not going to do that anymore. And that makes me really happy. So to activate this, you just pop that lever out. I'm gonna turn the bike on And then I'm just going to touch the lever down to the floor. And the bike lifts itself into that higher suspension position. So that I can just pop it right up onto the center stand. So for me, if I'm putting a bike up with luggage or something like that, it makes it considerably easier to do. Now this technology where the bike lifts itself on the back and the front to center stand it, it's pretty cool. It makes it very easy to pop it up. It has kind of a strange name. And this comes from Germans. They're good at coming up with cool ideas, but when they name them, sometimes when the name converts into the English language, it's a little wacky. So the technology you just saw where the bike lifts itself up to center stand is called the comfort jacking aid. <laughs> It, it helps you get it up. <laughs> and what is it in German? <laughs> oh, that's a good that's question. That's a good question. That's a good question. I don't know the German translation. Comfort lift question. system. <laughs> Comfort lift system. Co thank you. Oh, okay. Comfort lift system. Makes okay. sense, right? Thank you. Yeah. We should teach those Germans a little bit of English so that they would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, some of the um, project managers have, are, have started to get into the habit actually of sending me all of their paperwork when they, when they, um, before they actually publish it so that I can go through and do translations from their English to English. Um, that one didn't make it to me though. <laughs> so a lot of people ask us seat heights and I'm about to show you a very complicated slide and I want to explain it. There are three different suspension heights on the 1300GS, the Sport, which is the tallest, the Standard and the Adaptive. There are also three different seat options. 
So depending on which suspension and which seat you purchase, you'll get any one of these nine different seat heights. But the most important number is at the top. The lowest you can get it is 31 and a half. The highest you can get it is 35 and change. That was with standard original equipment manufacturer product. And when you when you sit on this bike, it's worth noting, so this is the adaptive ride height. Um, so it's going to be down here. And this has a standard seat on it. So it's sitting at about 32 and a third inches um, seat height. It can add, The bike can actually be shorter than this if you put a low seat on it. And then, of course, it can be much taller than this. Now, uh, wheels have always been a big part of adventure riding. Uh, spoked wheels versus alloy wheels. Uh, certainly on the GS, you've always had those choice between the two. Now this bike has alloy or cast wheels on it. And the benefit to cast wheels is that they're very light, they're very easy to maintain. The benefit to spoked wheels is that they are flexible. So if you're riding a bike with spoked wheels on it and you hit an obstacle, a rock in the trail, for example, the spoked will flex to absorb the impact and then flex back to their original shape most of the time. It's possible to bend a spoke wheel, but it's hard to do. That's the disadvantage of alloys. They're not flexible. They are malleable. So if you hit something hard enough, they will take on that new shape and they will keep it. Now, BMW is now offering a third wheel option. It's the new forged Enduro wheel. And what they do is they take a cast aluminum wheel and they forge it, which makes it much lighter and much stronger. And then they put a mill finish on it. So it's a very crisp finish on the wheel. It's very, very premium and it's much stronger than a conventional alloy wheel. It's not as strong as a spoked wheel. So if you are a very aggressive off-road rider and you hit a lot of rocks and baby head boulders and that sort of thing, the spoked wheel is still the best way to go. But if you're the type of rider that rides on fire roads, for example, you're not doing aggressive things where you're hitting rocks all the time, then the Forge and Dura wheel is a nice alternative. It's much stronger than a conventional cast wheel and it's four and a half pounds lighter than the spoked wheel. That is a lot less weight for angular momentum to consider. And it's worth looking up um, other photos of these wheels uh, because they're beautiful. I've seen them in person. They are absolutely yeah. beautiful wheels and this photo does not do it justice at all. <laughs> now one last thing I'm gonna tell you about and then I'm gonna turn you loose on the bike. Uh, one of the things we got to do is sit down with the product manager for the 1300GS and ask him a lot of questions. My first question to him was, what is the process for developing a new bike? What do you do? He said, well, the first thing we do is we ask what our riders want. And that's answer, that question is very easy to answer at first. Everybody wants more power. Everybody wants less weight, is very generally speaking. Once you get past those two things, it becomes a lot more difficult. Because a lot of the things that somebody might want the new GS to have will make it more off-road capable at the expense of being less on-road capable or vice versa. Plus, all of the designers and engineers that developed this bike are all GS riders too. And they all have their opinions. And he said it was very contentious. So the first couple of meetings we had, the first question we asked one another was, should it still have a boxer motor? So 1300 to get a totally new motor. And I said, are you serious? You almost got rid of the boxer motor? He goes, yeah, we were very close. We had another motor of mine and we almost went that way. And I go, I can't believe you would do that. The boxer motor is the GS motor. He goes, dude, calm down. It's got, a, it's got a boxer motor. I go, I know, but don't even say that. Goes, but the thing that we had to deal with is that none of us could make a bike that we all liked because we had too much variance in what we wanted out of the next GS. So to solve that problem, they've made four versions of the GS. There are now four variants. And I'm gonna show them to you. And as I show them to you, you're gonna find that some are more off-road oriented and some are more on-road oriented, but both will do either. For example, this is the base variant or the pure variant is this white colored GS. And they said this is, was the one that they could agree on first. It does the most of everything as equally as possible. Now, I do wanna point out that this particular one is not a base model. It has a lot of upgrades on it. It has, for example, the power windscreen, which is an option. You can also have the manual windscreen. This one has the lights on it, uh, the accessory lights that you see. It also has the, um, the ride height adjustment that you saw. And Louise there, is, she's got her hands by the rack. It's got the luggage kit on it. And you'll see she'll take off these little pucks. Those are to supply power to the bags. So when you put the bags on the bike, it gives the bags power so they have light inside. They have power so you can charge things when you ride. And they have a central locking system. 
so that you can hit a button on the handlebars or even walk away from your bike and it will automatically lock the bags as you get some distance between you and the bike. Now, another variant is the triple black, which is a more street oriented variant, much more comfortable for street riding. Bigger windscreen, more comfortable seats, more uh, heated seat, bigger foot pegs, these sorts of things. The green that you see here, the option 719, the green is just absolutely stunning. It is so beautiful. The picture does not do it justice. But this has the premium parts and accessories on it. The option 719 milled aluminum valve covers, side view mirrors, levers, etc. And then finally, there is the trophy variants. This has the most off road capability. You can put the sport suspension on this bike, make it extra tall. There is an enduro kit you can put on it that will have engine protection bars, a skid plate, valve cover protectors, so that when you ride aggressively off road, the bike can take a beating. And you'll see, for example, on this bike, this bike has the hand protector blinkers. They're built in here. All the variants have the hand protectors here, except the trophy variants. If you get the trophy variant with the enduro kit, it takes these off and it puts conventional blinkers on. Because if you ride this bike off road, you're gonna drop it. And if you drop it, you don't wanna drop it on these because those are expensive to replace. And then having them in a regular place is a lot more helpful. Now, all of these variants, there's lots of features that make up the variant, but a lot of those features are cross compatible. So if you see one variant that you like and you would like features from another variant, with some limitations, that is possible to do. But the idea here is to give you the variant that you want to do what you wanna do. Now, I know you would like to come and take a look at the bike and touch it and sit on it and that's all fine. Before you do, we would like to answer any questions you have about the 1300 GS. Yes, sir. Uh, in regard to this bike, when you go to the Enduro package and the stock tube up there, does that preclude not having the wings attached to the plastic wing? What wings are you referring to? Oh, the, um, the, the cups. The cups. Yeah. Yeah. These, okay. The, okay, so the question is, is if you have the Enduro kit, is it gonna have these flares, these wings right. here? Stop the wheel up there, I understand. Yeah, so, this, so the Enduro kit, the windscreen is smaller and it doesn't have these flares on it. You can certainly put them on, but it doesn't come with them because that's another thing that if you drop a bike, you have the chance of breaking. Good question, sir. Yes, sir. Up on the steering, that new plate that affects the suspension. Yes, sir. With the removing of the balls, did you speak a little bit about that, how the steering is isolated? Sure. So the question is about the steering and the new suspension. So this, this bike has a telelever suspension system. Which is, the Boxer Twin has had the telelever suspension system for a very long time. The problem with the telelever is that if you have a bike with a small amount of suspension travel, the telelever works really well. It's great for sport bikes, for example. But if you have a bike like the GS that has a lot of suspension travel, what happens is, is because of the way the telelever is designed, when the suspension completely compresses, the bars will move forward and back as the suspension compresses and rebounds. It is a very awkward feeling, and it is no good for motorcycle riding of any sort. So what they did in the past was they found a way to bolt the bars so that the bars wouldn't move forward and back when the suspension compressed. The trade-off to that was that you didn't have as good a road feel. It sort of suppressed some of the feel of the road with the telelever, so it didn't feel as good as conventional suspension. And what they've done with the new telelever is they've redesigned it and they put this new piece that you'll see when you come up front and get close to it. It's the best equivalent is like a torsion bar. And what it does is it allows for all the road feel and suspension travel without the forward to back movement of the bars. So it's sort of the best of both worlds. We were actually surprised that they still had a telelever on it. Because technology is becoming so advanced that it's kind of questionable whether you need it. And the, the product manager is very, very proud of this. He goes, no, 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 you ride this. I don't care what suspension you've seen out there, but unless it's $80,000 suspension, this is gonna beat it. It's really easy. I don't know if that's true, but that's what he said. This, that was fun. probably the upgrade on this bike that the project manager was most proud of. He was really excited about the new Telelever no. um, suspension. You're gonna love it. Yeah. This bike feels like a sport bike. Yeah. We've ridden it. It's a sport bike that says GS. Yeah. Gentlemen scrambler no more. Yes, sir. The uh, leaf braking? Yes, sir. Specifically the rear one, can you disable that so you're not in the front or is that an automatic? So the question is, is with integral brakes, can you turn off integral brakes? You can turn off anti-lock brakes on the back tire. So you can make it so the rear tire locks. You can never turn off partial or integral brakes and you've never have been able to. For as long as there's been, from 2002 on, 
if you had a boxer twin and it had ABS brakes, it had partial integral brakes. Yeah, on the front, it's got the old GS on the rear still by itself, which yep. means you can drag into it and you don't ever reach that point where it kicks the front end. Now, you have the RT, you know, would drag the rear, and all of a sudden you'd go a little too far, and the front would die because it was kicking in the front. What year was your RT, sir? Yeah, so they, they used to have fully integral brakes, I got rid of it, because yeah. it was, did exactly what you described. Yeah. This is not a problem anymore. The oh, new, yeah. integral, new integral brakes is way more sophisticated. And we have ridden this bike, and it did not get in our way in any way. We were able to do all the cool dragging things, and I think you'll find it will be pleasantly surprised. And, and now it, it changes depending on your ride mode. So if you're in Enduro Pro and you have the um, ABS disabled on the back, and you're using just the back, it's going to feel, it, it's not going to feel like your RT did. And the new, the new RT since 2021, and even the R18s, um, they have fully integral brakes as well. So they've been, they, this has been on bikes for a couple of years. It's just the first time that we're seeing it on the GS. So they had a couple of years to make sure they perfected it and made it work with the ride modes. So especially for those of us who ride off-road and want to lock up that rear brake, for one reason or another, you know, it's it's not going to give us that sudden dive. Yeah. On the SOS button, is that completely disableable, or does it calibrate for situations like off road? With a, a this is a very good question. The, the question is, is, can you disable the SOS button? And I don't know. The, this bike that we have here for you to see is a European spec bike. It, mostly what that means to you is that the rear blinkers are different than the US spec bikes blinkers will be. US spec bikes, the blinkers are bigger and they're dimmer. It's not BMW's choice, this is DOT talking here. But the other difference is, is that the software is a little different. So I don't know if the US spec bike is gonna have a disabling feature or not. It might have to, I don't know. Um, because we haven't been in a chance to play with it yet. And when somebody's dropping a bike, and it's calling all the time. Believe me, people at the car center would like you to not call 30 times a day too. Um, but you, you find a way around it. When I was riding in Spain, where I was with 20 other people, we were all on bikes that they ride off-road all the time. And the call center is very patient. Yeah. So and this, is, this has been in other countries for several years now. This is the first time that we're seeing it in this country, but it has been around, so we'll yeah. see, but we'll see how it goes. The other thing you're gonna see on this bike in terms of electronics is the new TFT display. It's gonna look the same to you, but it has one feature that no GS has ever had. It is the dumbest thing they've ever put on a bike. It is the sport display. Ooh. The sport display, when you're on this bike, you can lean it into a turn, and the bike will tell you in real time what your lean angle is, <laughs> and, and, and it will compare it against your best lean angle of the ride. <laughs> so every time you come out of a turn, you go, Oh, they do. And then I can do better than that. And even I go, you guys, man, this is America. You can't give us that thing. We're going to bring that thing all the way to its side. This yeah, Sean, we have the same ride modes as with the 1250? So the question is, is, does it have the same ride modes as the 1250? Yes. It has seven ride modes, just like the 1250. Eco, Rain, Road, Dynamic, Dynamic Pro, Enduro, and Enduro Pro. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Is the sport suspension only available for the uh, trophy version? Excellent question. Is the sport suspension available only in the trophy? The answer is currently yes. If you want sport, you gotta get the trophy. And I'm gonna answer the second question that people ask that you didn't, which is, can you get adaptive ride height with sport suspension? No. You either get the tallest possible suspension or you get the adaptive ride height. You can't have both. We actually mentioned that to the product manager. Can we have both? And he goes, why would you want both? I said, because it's America, and it's and, cool. And I'm like, people like me would like both. I would love all that suspension travel and like the nice tall bike when I'm riding. Yeah, and, then, like, and then for it to get low when I come to a stop. And he was like, huh, so maybe, maybe. we'll see that in the future, but not not yet. Sir. Can you remove the cruise control sensor lock to save a cost and drop it right Oh, can you get the bike without the sensors? Yeah. Yo. Yeah, absolutely. The cruise control, uh, the the cruise control is standard, so you get that no matter what. The active cruise control is optional, so you can get it without that. Absolutely, if you want. What about the, if you go off roading, you remove it? Is it a little Ooh, can you take it off when you ride off road? I don't think so. I don't know how you would. It's integrated. Yeah. 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 Enduro Pro. Yeah. 
I mean, it's, it's been my experience. Yeah, it, it, cruise control won't work at all in the off-road mode. Yeah. Uh, on any BMW with off-road modes. Um, but uh, there's, there's. But you're asking about taking it off, so, yeah, like, so sure that you wouldn't expensive. break it. I don't That's think that these things are pretty tough. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think if you break that, you've got bigger problems than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, that, like, the radiator is always the scariest thing for me when I'm riding off-road, and it only happens when you're riding in groups. Yeah. That's when you screw up. You ride too close to the person in front of you, and they start kicking up rocks, and the rocks hit stuff. That's it. So always ride in front. <laughs> that's the rule. Yes, sir. So the question is, is where's the sensor? So, so you know, if you have the keyless ride and the, the, the battery goes dead and you're out on the roadside somewhere and you can't use it, that there's enough power in it, even with a dead battery, that if you put it right up on the sensor that picks it up, the bike will read it and start, even if you don't have a battery in it. And this this bike, the sensor is directly to the seat. The, the front seat. Or you can carry a spare battery. And, and actually, the new fob or has a bike. feature where you can push um, the little BMW roundel on it and it will light up green, yellow, or red to let you know what your battery health is. Ooh, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. That's fancy. She knows stuff. Yeah. Sir? Can we hear it? The amazing yeah. German exhaust note. You guys want to start it? Well, let's, when we uh, finish up here, if they're okay with us starting it inside, we will. Otherwise, we'll take it outside. Yeah. Yep. Sir? Then you. I'm curious, uh, you know the adaptive cruise control, if you've just ridden off-road and you're coming back on the street and there's a big blob of mud there, will it interfere with the, with the sensors? Or so you have to clean it first and then go on road. If you've ever driven a car with adaptive cruise control, if yeah. you get too much mud and film over the lens, it stops working. Okay. It's exactly the same here. And it, it tells you, it gives you a warning and it okay. tells you that, that it's not functioning for some reason and you're probably going to know, oh, I was out riding in the mud and yeah. I should probably take Chances that are, if you can't see out your lens and your goggles, <laughs> you probably can't see out the front of that. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Sir. Okay. Um, as far as the blind spot indicators, you said those are, the indicators are in the mirrors, right? Yes, sir. So well, that's one of the places they are. Okay, yes. so they're on the dash too. Mm -hmm. The mirrors are normally the first thing I saw about. Like, <coughs> So the, the indicators, if you, this bike tells you three different ways that there's danger. It tells you through the mirrors, it tells you through the display, and it tells you as the vibration in the handlebars. Okay. So, and all of that is adjustable. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're not looking at the mirrors, but there's danger, you'll also feel it in the bar. If you have that feature turned on, and if you have that option. Yes, sir. Any, uh changes in the nav system and the TFT? <laughs> so, so the question is regarding navigation. So in the case of the 1250 and in the 1300, it is possible to use an app on your phone called the Connected Riot app, and you can send navigation information from your phone to the TFT if they're linked together. It is very rudimentary. So it's just the air left, right, straight arrows and distance to turn. But there's also a new navigation system, and it's actually on this bike right now. It's called the Connected Ride Navigator. It's no longer made by Garmin. It's a TomTom -Tom product, and it is way better than anything we've ever seen from a BMW Navigator. It is much more sophisticated. And for my money, I still want a separate Navigator anyway, because there's just things I need a nav to do that I can't expect a TFT to give me, even with bikes that have integrated navigation. But for those of you that want to see in the TFT, you can a little bit. It's not as good as it could be. Maybe someday. One more question, and then we're going to give you a chance to come look at it. Yes, sir. The, uh, the, camera view part, but is the motor still a shift cam motor, and the clutch access is it still being So the, the question is, is it still use shift cam technology? Yes, it does. And the other question is accessing the clutch. It's still in the front. You still take the front panel off if you, you know, the clutch is, you, it's, it's possible to overwork a clutch. And, and the way you do it is by getting the RPMs over 3,000 and then trying to engage and disengage the clutch. And this is a wet clutch. You know, with dry clutches, you could always tell when you overworked it because you could smell it. It made a very distinctive smell. The way a wet clutch tells you that, it is, that it's being overworked is the bike will stop moving forward and it will never move forward again. <laughs> And the only way to get to me, and everybody tells me, I was just riding to church, and all of a sudden it stopped. You can tell when you pull the clutch cover off if a clutch has been abused. <laughs> they have a very distinct look. So on this bike, it's the same. The only major difference is if you need to get to the transmission, 
You have to take the engine out. But in the past, you had to split the bike in half anyway. So I challenge you to find the, the uh, uh, oil filter on this bike. Yeah. Try to find it. I'll give you a nickel if you find it. Can I okay. Can I still get to myself or I can do it? You can do it yourself. Yeah. All right. I know it's not always easy to ask questions in the group, so we're going to welcome you to come up and take a look at the bike. If you have questions for us, come and find us. We're here as long as you are. I want to thank my friends at Ride Now here in Austin. Thank you very much for having us. Very kind of you. Can you give them a hand of applause?